I am Edward Dennis, and I welcome you to this lecture on specialized lipids and disease. This lecture will be divided in two parts. In the first, we will focus on sphingolipids by first defining the various sphingolipids, turning then to cerebrocytes and gangliosides, complex forms of the sphingolipids, and conclude by examining various lipid storage diseases, which are diseases lacking the ability to break down certain sphingolipids. In part B, we will explore other lipids in energy metabolism. First, ketone bodies, which relate closely to diabetes. And then in the second part, we will integrate ketone bodies and other lipid metabolic pathways of lipid metabolism. Learning objectives for this lecture is summarized on this slide, and I recommend you read these over at your leisure. The reading chapters for this lecture are listed here. The simplest sphingolipid is a sphingosine, which is an amino alcohol with a trans double bond. The particular compound shown here, it has an 18 carbon amino alcohol with the trans double bond. Ceramids are sphingosines in which the amino group is esterified to a long chain fatty acid. Sphingomyelin is a ceramid in which the hydroxyl group is esterified to a phosphorylcholine, making a compound with some similarity to phosphatidylcholine. Sphingosine derives from the combination of pomatyl-CoA and the amino acid serine with the loss of the CoA group and a CO2 from serine. This complex is then reduced and an additional acyl group is added as an acyl-CoA to the amino group on the sphingosine, which gives rise to a dihydroceramid and then another oxidation to produce the double bond uh, that is in the final compound. Shown here is actually an n acyl sphingosine, another name for which is ceramid. The phosphorylated form of sphingosine, sphingosine 1-phosphate, is a very important intracellular and extracellular signaling molecule. Sphingosine kinase phosphorylates sphingosine to make sphingosine 1-phosphate, and there is a sphingosine phosphatase which can break it down to sphingosine. Sphingosine 1-phosphate is a sort of lysophospholipid, which can act as a potent messenger molecule, both intra and intercellularly. Within the cell, it promotes mitosis and inhibits apoptosis. It also regulates calcium mobilization and cell growth 
in response to a variety of extracellular signals and stimuli. Outside of the cell, the sphingosine 1-phosphate binds to G-protein-coupled receptors on cell surfaces. There is a whole family of specific receptors, and uh, they are different from cell to cell. Special roles for sphingosine 1-phosphate occur with immune cells where they affect a variety of important regulatory mechanisms. It's important to recognize that the transformation from sphingosine to ceramid is affected by the addition of a fatty acyl CoA to the amide group. Similarly, the ceramid can be converted further to sphingomyelin by the addition of a phosphorylcholine head group. That phosphorylcholine is actually derived from phosphatidylcholine, where there is an exchange of that phosphorylcholine onto the ceramid backbone, releasing diacylglycerol as a free molecule. The resulting sphingomyelin in many ways resembles phosphatidylcholine. In these stereospecific drawings, it can easily be seen how similar sphingomyelin and phosphatidylcholine are. The phosphatidylcholine generally contains a saturated fatty acid on the one position, whereas sphingomyelin contains a essentially saturated fatty acid, but with a single double bond adjacent to the hydroxy group, as shown on the top. The second fatty acyl group that is added on phospholipids as an ester, um, similarly can be added on the amide group of sphingomyelin, and the phosphorylcholine are the same. However, overall, the sphingomyelin is, has less double bonds, generally, than phosphatidylcholines, and uh, gives rise to a less soluble or less fluid membrane component. Similarly, sphingosine 1-phosphate is very similar to lysophosphatidic acid, as shown here, the difference being primarily that extra double bond and hydroxyl group in the sphingosine molecule. But they are very specifically different and distinct chemical structures and bind to distinct and different G protein coupled receptors. Pyramids can also be modified to form complex glycolipids. The ceramid backbone, when it acquires a sugar on the hydroxyl group, becomes a cerebroside. There are two common cerebrosides. Galactose cerebroside, as shown here, when the sugar is a galactose, and glucocerebroside when the sugar is a glucose. This constitutes the addition of a single sugar to, through a glycosidic bond to the ceramid backbone. 
when additional sugars are added, including sialic acid, the compounds become gangliosides, which is a term for a ceramid that has multiple sugars, including at least one sialic acid residue. Ceramids result from the condensation of the ceramide backbone with a UDP sugar, illustrated here for UDP glucose, giving rise to the glucocerebroside and free UDP. The UDP glucose is, of course, formed from UTP and glucose and illustrates that the key intermediate in sugar synthesis and glycosidic bond formation is the uridine nucleotide rather than ATP. More than one sugar residue is present. The cerebroside becomes a ganglioside, which contains multiple sugars, each activated by UDP in a similar manner. And sialic acid is activated and added by the cytidine nucleotides. Gangliosides can have a variety of complex structures, as is illustrated here. Interestingly, the sphingolipids are not broken down or degraded easily. The amide bond makes a particularly stable molecule. Enzymatic degradation is common and is the mechanism to break down sphingolipids, but there are a large number and a complicated group of pathways due to the heterogeneity of the gangliosides. Specific monogenic defects in some of these enzymes can lead to an accumulation of specific sphingolipids. Most of the resultant diseases are rare, but they are more common in certain ethnicities. Key lipid storage diseases such as Gaucher's, Tay-Sachs, Fabry's, and neiman pick disease are very well characterized. This slide depicts the major lipid storage diseases known. They all involve the degradation of complex sphingolipids, as illustrated, and the specific enzyme defect is shown. Many of these have acquired specific names particularly by the discoverers of these diseases, such as Sandhoff and Fabry's disease, as illustrated here. And a large number of steps in sphingolipid degradation are shown, including at the very end, the breakdown of cerebrosides, and ceramides themselves, which can cause accumulation of products. Tay-Sachs disease is one of the most well-known of these. 
it has a particular high rate in Ashkenazi Jews who are carriers of this disease. The symptoms are all neurodegenerative, as indicated here, and they are due to a lack of GM2 hexaminidase A, which is an autorecessive gene. Gangliocide GM2 builds up, and it builds up particularly in the CNS and can often be spotted uh, in the retina by the presence of a cherry red spot as indicated. There's currently no good therapy for this disease and patients typically die in early childhood. It is a very attractive target for gene therapy uh, should the technology be developed to enable it. Even more common disease is Gaucher's disease, where the incidence is 1 in 13 of Ashkenazi Jews who are carriers. It results in an enlarged liver and spleen and many ramifications of this. It's due to a defect in the beta glucosidase and the buildup of glucosyl acyl sphingosine. In other words, glucosyl ceramid. For this disease, Recombinant beta glucosidase uh, is a possible treatment because the enzyme replacement therapy uh, can get to the site of action. Less common than Gaucher's disease or Tay Sachs disease is Neiman Pick disease type A, which is still pretty prevalent. It results in neurodegenerative diseases uh, with many ramifications for the growing infant and death at a very early age. It results from a lack of sphingomyelinase, and therefore sphingomyelin builds up in the CNS in liver and lungs and patients die at a very early age. Let's conclude with a summary of today's sphingolipids. Sphingosine is clearly the simplest. It results from the combination of pomatyl-CoA and the amino acid serine, and it's a very important signaling molecule. With the addition of a fatty acid to the amide group of sphingosine, one gets ceramid, which is also a very important signaling molecule. When a phosphorylcholine is added to the ceramid, it becomes a sphingomyelin and is a very abundant lipid in membranes. With the addition of a single sugar or monosaccharide to the ceramid backbone, one can form cerebrosides. And with additional sugars and sialic acid, one can form gangliosides, which are quite complex glycolipids that are very rich in brain and the CNS and their presence can account for a number of very important lipid storage diseases.